Uh, the Climate Reality Project is a community of climate activists from all political stripes. We are set who try to address climate change. Uh, we are putting solutions into policy agendas at federal and local levels of government. And our movement is composed of everyday Americans who are concerned about passing on a healthy economy and a healthy environment to the next generation. So we encourage all of you to join our movement and we'll provide you with uh, information on how to do that if you're not already part of the uh, of, of climate reality. Um, the South Idaho chapter consists, consists of Idahoans and Oregonians who acknowledge that climate change is a threat to the next generation of, of rural Americans. And we are committed to trying to do something about it. We have members from Idaho Falls, Lapway, Ontario, Eagle, Twin Falls, Pocatello, Salmon, Haley, Victor, Stanley, Cuna, McCall, and many other communities within the Snake River watershed. And we've all come together to support a clean, sustainable, vibrant, and innovative Idaho and Oregon. So we know technology changes happen. Technological change happens on a regular basis. Innovation happens, and it makes our communities safer, healthier, more just, cleaner, and wealthier. The transformation from a hydrocarbon economy to a clean energy economy is just the latest in many technology, technology changes over the centuries. We've transitioned from whale blubber candles to kerosene as a way to read at night. We've upgraded from landlines to cell phones. We've shifted away from horse-drawn carriages to uh, the internal combustion engine, for example. And thank goodness we graduated away from dial-up internet to fiber. Well, not all of us, I think some people maybe in salmon might still have dial up. Um, but today's transition from hydrocarbons to wind, geothermal, nuclear, and solar is a challenge that we already know how to master. So thanks for attending today, and we hope that you'll join our movement. And I'll hand it over to Catalin. All right, awesome. Thanks for that introduction, Bryant. Um, so we'll ask that you please keep your video on and your microphone on mute. As a speaker, it's just really nice to see the faces and it feels like we're more in person and um, you can feel the engagement of the community that you're speaking to. So we really appreciate it if you can turn on your, your video, that would be great. So the goals of today's conversation are to learn what is urban forestry? What role does urban forestry play in climate change mitigation? What is urban forestry like in our area and how can we learn more about it, especially if we don't live in Boise? And how can we as citizens participate in urban forestry? So um, Brian and I will be collecting questions and comments throughout the presentation. And then um, we'll have more of a Q&A session um, at the end of the talk. We can come off mute if you'd like to and, and ask your question. Um, but if you don't feel comfortable asking your own question, you can also just let us know and we'd be happy to ask it for you. Um, so just go ahead and send, either put it in the chat or send either Bryant or me a direct message. Um, so our lovely speakers today are Amy and Lance. Amy Parrish has worked for the city of Boise for over six years as the climate data analysis. Analyst, sorry. <laughs> she has the privilege of working on a wide range of energy and climate projects, including natural climate solutions, building energy use, electrical vehicles, and greenhouse gases. Um, and then Lance has lived in Boise since 2011, where he started the Keystone concept after 11 years in government service in the states of Washington and New Mexico. So throughout his, his 20 plus year career as a natural resource professional, he has served in a variety of leadership roles centered on building resilient and impactful organizations, communities, and people. And in his free time, Lance enjoys whitewater rafting, mountain biking, camping, and hiking with his wife, son, and daughter. So Lance and Amy, uh, thank you for joining us and I'll go ahead and hand it over to you. Thank you very much, Catalan and Bryant. I'll go ahead and tee up my screen. And we're excited about this conversation with all of you. You're a very diverse group. See a few friends and a few new faces in the crowd, which is awesome. Um, and we've got a slide deck here that's gonna talk a little bit how we work together. Uh, Amy from the Climate Division and myself with Treasure Valley Canopy Network. But really what we wanted to do is spur a conversation with all of you once we share what we've been up to. So the City of Boise and the Treasure Valley Canopy Network work very closely to build robust and vibrant urban forests in the City of Trees. So you learned a little bit about Amy and myself. You can ask plenty of questions of us as we go along the way. 
We're going to focus on a few things. One, we're going to start with the climate action agenda, which Amy and her team run that program at the city of Boise. And then we'll talk about the nonprofit, the Treasure Valley Canopy Network, and what that does to help support what the city of Boise is building. And then we'll dive a little bit into a few things that you might not be aware about of how city of Boise is building a vibrant living infrastructure all throughout the city that really is creating climate solutions for better lifestyles for us for years and years to come. And then we'll end on a call to action for you to join us in the City of Trees Challenge, if you have not heard about that before, launched by Council President Clegg in 2020. So I'll kick it over to Amy. Thank you, Lance, and thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Um, Lance, can you hear me okay with my, my mic? Okay. So I'm going to start off and talk some broadly about Boise's climate goals. Uh, hopefully you've heard of some of these. We have some, some overarching clean energy and climate goals. Um, in 2030, we have a goal for our entire city government to be run with clean electricity. All well, um, and then 2035, carbon neutral city government. So those build on each other. If we can get all our electricity to be clean, then that will significantly contribute to our carbon neutral goal in 2035. And the same deal goes for the community. In the community, which we mean the whole city of Boise, we hope to have 100% clean electricity by 2035. And that will be a significant contributor to our goal in 2050 of carbon neutral um, carbon neutrality. Yeah, so next slide, please, Lance. So what do we mean when we say carbon neutrality? This is a term that's thrown around a lot and I wanted to really clarify what we're talking about here. So what we wanna do is first, we wanna eliminate as many emissions as possible. And how do we do that? The, the easiest way to do that, honestly, is use less, less energy, be as efficient as you can. This is also a lot of times one of the most cost-effective ways to go about um, reducing your carbon footprint. Um, and then we want to invest in clean energy. So <clears throat> what do we mean by clean energy? Clean electricity, those, those clean electricity goals that I just mentioned. Um, and we are open to other forms of clean energy as well. We would love to see renewable natural gas become more available. Maybe hydrogen will become an actual feasible thing in the future. Who knows? Um, fingers crossed. We, we will... We are agnostic, basically, when it comes to, to clean energy. And then electrification. Um, if we can get clean energy, right now, our best bet to clean energy is clean electricity. And so if we can get 100% clean electricity, and then we can convert all of most of our energy use to electricity, then we would be carbon neutral. So if you run your whole house on electricity and your electricity is coming from a carbon neutral source, then you have a carbon neutral house. And same with cars. If you have an electric vehicle and that electric vehicle is charged with carbon neutral electricity, then you have a carbon neutral car. However, we recognize that there will be some emissions that will be really, really challenging to eliminate. And so we will offset the last of those emissions. Um, and those pictures, those are just some examples of different kinds of offsets. There's trees, there's methane capture from, from cows, there's soil, improving soil health. And then that last picture on the bottom right is an actual like direct air capture machine. Um, and those technologies, it's a little unclear where that's headed right now, but a lot of people are pretty optimistic that maybe that will be a viable solution as well. So next slide, please, Lance. Um, and we, in order to reach these goals, we developed, um, okay, yeah, I want, I want them, you can stop and then we can have them come up one at a time, yeah. Um, in order to reach these goals, we developed a roadmap last summer that outlines our path to reaching those. And so the road, this roadmap, it's available online. If you haven't seen it, you can look at it. Google Boise Climate Action and it should pop up and you should be able to, to find a link for it. 
Um, our vision in creating this roadmap was to create a city for everyone. And again, we wanna meet those goals that I just discussed, the carbon neutral goal by 2035 and the community carbon neutrality goal by 2050. And we also have a really important goal in there of enhancing, enhancing Boise's resiliency and ability to adapt to climate change impacts. Because many of you, I'm sure that given this, this group of folks, you are probably pretty aware of, of climate change science. And unfortunately, even if we stop emitting all carbon today, we will still see impacts into the future. So climate change is here and we have to figure out how to adapt. Okay, so next. Um, in developing this roadmap, we had some guiding principles and those were to advance equity, improve human health and wellness and grow a climate economy. And next. And we have essentially like seven priority areas that the roadmap covers. Um, and those are energy and buildings, transportation, consumption and waste, innovation and engagement, food systems, natural environment, and water. And as you are on the left side of those priorities, the, especially the yellow and the blue, those, that side has more emissions reductions benefits associated with it. And then as you move over to the right, there's more resilience benefits associated with all of those priorities. Um, and then if you will get into this more in the next slide, but there's opportunities underneath all of those priorities as well, which we just list out specific categories. Oh, and here we are. So as you can see, like we'll just do natural environment, for example, because that's what we are here to talk about is trees under our natural environment priority. We will be focusing on the urban tree canopy, healthy ecosystems and access to open spaces. And so that's what I'm here. I'm linking, trying to link how trees are a huge part of climate and we are really excited about the role that they play in our climate action plan. And this is our big highlight, which we are so proud of and Lance already mentioned, the City of Trees Challenge. Um, one tree for every household in the city, one seedling for every person. And um, trees are crucial because they have so many benefits associated with them that I'm really excited to get into on some future slides and Lance will get into as well. Um, so here is example one. This is the carbon sequestration ability of our tree canopy. So when you look at our tree canopy as a whole, it's estimated um, that we, that our tree canopy absorbs about 25 thousand metric tons of carbon per year, which is a significant amount. So I have on the right there, this is our greenhouse gas emissions inventory from 2020 for city operations. And you can see that our entire city operations, and that's all of the buildings that the city operates, city hall, all the fire stations, plus our whole water renewal facility and our farm and all our pumps, everything put together is about 41,000 metric tons of carbon. And our tree canopy absorbs more than half of that. So that's phenomenal. Um, and then just looking at the brand new trees planted in the City of Trees Challenge, those alone are absorbing 6,000 pounds per year. So this is it's not going to get us to where we need to be. We need to basically do all the actions um, to get to where we really need to be. But trees are an important part of that and they shouldn't be discounted. Like we definitely would love to see that increase um, and see more trees planted. Another huge benefit that, that trees play in the climate arena is that they can help reduce urban heat. Um, there is a term called like the urban heat island effect. And if you look at that map, that colored map with the green and red and purple, um, the red areas are areas of the city that are very hot. And then 
on the other end of the scale, the purple areas are significantly cooler. So there is a 13 degree difference. And this is the same time of day. So this, um, this map is showing like an evening from 7 p.m. to 8 p.m., a summer evening, that there is a huge difference in variability of heat in different parts of town. And so if you go over to the bottom right hand corner, there's a graph that shows how that heat difference is attributed at least partially to the tree canopy. Um, as you increase tree canopy, temperatures decrease. And that makes, I mean, it's kind of almost common sense because you get so much shade from a tree. Um, so urban heat is something that trees can have a huge impact in helping to alleviate. Next slide, Lance. Oh, and I'm gonna kick it over to Lance now. Yeah, thank you very much, Amy. So Amy captured it very well. We've got to do a lot of different things, including uh, move away from emissions, but also the tree part is important. So thank you for highlighting that. And I get to talk about the Treasure Valley Canopy Network. We are a nonprofit that was born back in 2013, started with state and federal funding. So I think it's a pretty good story about how federal investment in our communities can grow and spur opportunities that grow beyond that federal investment. So now we are 100% locally funded by our local contributing members, which includes City of Boise, City of Nampa, City of Meridian, Idaho Power, a whole bunch of partners. And we really are focused on how can we strategically plant trees to have an impact and make a difference in our communities. So getting back to where we started, we kind of almost align with the 8th of Main revitalization. So it's fun to look back when the city was all of a sudden getting money invested in it to improve, we were born as well. We had that urban tree canopy assessment and we started this organization, which in the beginning was simply the group of people that got together to learn more about the benefit of our trees for air quality, water quality, storm water. And the state invested in us for a few more years. We became a nonprofit organization. And at around that same time, partially, I believe, because of the recognition among city council in Boise of the benefits of trees, they decided to prioritize investing in tree canopy. And we'll talk a little bit about how they're still doing that today. The city of Boise completed their community forestry strategic plan, which a lot of our grassroots effort was involved in helping make that happen. And then our first pilot project, which has been highly successful, is with Idaho Power Company and their shade tree project, which started in the Treasure Valley in 2013 and now serves all the Idaho Power within Idaho, all of their service area. You basically plant a tree to the west side of your house, you get that tree for free, and it eventually shades your house enough to reduce your peak season energy use. And so what you'll see from there, we continued to develop projects and programs that would have an impact and make a difference. The urban heat mapping campaign, we helped bring that together with Portland State University. We just sold our first carbon credit offsets with a program called City Forest Credits in the city of Boise. We've launched the City of Trees Challenge with Council President Clay, and we're also building an urban wood network that's helping make sure that large trees that must come down because they're aging or falling, they will not go to the dump. They will be recycled. That carbon will continue to be harnessed in the form of tables and chairs and great furniture in our communities and in our businesses. So this picture on the left, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about. This is a tree that came down in the North End a large aging tree that needed to come down. And that now in the house behind it is a table in their house. And also the maker that milled that tree helped to uh, sell those all over. I've heard of some of it going up to McCall as well. So a really good story in what we're trying to build this circular urban wood economy in the Treasure Valley. The Idaho Power Shade Tree, you see that in the upper right-hand corner. It is really hot, as you know, as you can see in Ethan's screen there, He's got the sun coming in. If he had a shade tree there, it would help his house use less energy to heat it in the summer months. Uh, as Amy talked about, this urban heat data has been really powerful. And then here in the lower right-hand corner is our city forest credits project with city of Boise. It's six different city parks 
and we are helping fund the tree planting in those parks with carbon offsets that have been purchased by a national buyer. Now let's dive into a little bit of how the city's investing in building a really vibrant downtown and having trees as a living infrastructure. Raise your hand in the, do you have the ability to raise your hand? Raise your hand if you've ever heard of Silva cells or suspended pavement systems. And we can see how many people are familiar with that. Basically here, you see the issue with trees in the urban environment is if you didn't have these stacked cells under here where you see the roots growing, the tree would only be able to grow in this box right here. So it's typically gonna survive 10, if you're lucky, 15 years. It kind of looks pretty, but by the time it's big enough to provide all these benefits we talk about, it's starting to die and they need to replace it. So the city said, we're gonna put our money where our mouth is when CCDC invests in new streetscapes and new fronts to the buildings, we're gonna invest in this suspended pavement technology. So you can see all these areas that are zoned and slowly growing and it's growing out west, you'll start seeing this as well. And they're really investing in large vibrant tree canopy. This is looking in the central edition live district, which is on Broad Street. This was all redesigned. There are those silver cell structures that we talk about right here for all these trees so they can grow roots. That soil also processes stormwater from all these buildings and the streets. So this is a bioswale here that is capturing stormwater and cleaning that water before it goes to the river. You have these permeable pavers here that cars park on and you have the double row of street trees that can help shade and reduce that urban heat. These trees of course are, those were there before but those were able to be retained in the development. And then also the mix of the old homes and the new construction. So City of Boise really is a leader in this effort. And here you see the example of how it works. This has no stormwater infrastructure other than the draining from the street. This right here, this is the same day it's dry because all the stormwater filtered into these areas. And now it's clean going to the river instead of filled with all the dirty stuff that is in stormwater from the streets. This is what the Silva cell looks like. And I say Silva cell, there are a few different products. Silva cell is uh, the one that I think most, if not all of City of Boise's are that, but they're open, it's always an open bidding process. So they provide the specs and then the company builds that to spec. But it's really been a fun journey on how we've implemented those within City of Boise. And here's the difference, that's only two years of growth on the same tree in downtown Boise. All this area here has suspended pavement system so that that tree can grow roots in there. So it makes a huge difference. And now we'll look a bit at the City of Trees Challenge. Like I said, this was started to our surprise in 2020 when City Council President Clegg had an interview with Boise Dev and said, you know what? I wanna plant 100,000 trees in Boise. And when that started to come out, she, Elaine is very smart. She's worked with us for many years. She knew that that was possible, but also a lot of the tree people in town were thinking, woo, that's, that's a lot. Um, I don't know if we can do it. And sure enough, in that conversation, we were in a meeting at the time when we were talking about it. And when I came out of that meeting, there was a message on my phone from Elaine that said, we need your help to make this happen. So it's very grassroots. It's public-private partnership. It's the Treasure Valley Canopy Network, the City of Boise, and the Nature Conservancy of Vido helping to plant these trees. And not only plant these trees, but to grow them over time. We're not just counting trees going in the ground. The city's investing a lot of money in making sure that they last over time and they grow and thrive for years to come. So if you look at our City of Trees website, just go to cityoftreeschallenge.org. You'll notice that we're very focused on not only counting the trees, but what benefits do those provide? This is all from an engine called iTree that looks at those trees and calculates the ecosystem service benefits. And then we're using a lot of really exciting tools to address equity throughout our city to plant trees where they're needed most, where it's hotter, where people can't afford trees and where trees are really needed to improve the quality of life. And I'll kick it over to Amy to talk about, there, there's two tools we used. One was this American Forest Tree Equity Tool. And then the other city of Boise has built a really valuable tool to strategically target their efforts in any kind of climate action. So you wanna tell us about that, Amy? Yeah, I'll go over this real quick. Um, the city made the Clean Cities Index recently, and 
It's essentially a guide to understanding variation in environmental and health and equity metrics across the city. And so we took data that was available, relevant, and um, at the census track level, we mapped that data to identify different regions that we could target for different priority programs. Um, and what are some of the things that went into this? Tree canopy cover, urban heat. Like those are two, two of the metrics that we used to identify where we could target tree plantings, for example. Like you look at, you can overlap that with other metrics if you're interested, but um, it was, it, it was eye-opening and we're really proud that, uh, that Lance was able to use this in his tree planting efforts this fall. Um, so it, he was able to target specific neighborhoods based on the data that came from the Clean Cities Index. So Lance, you can go into how you did that. Yes, and what has been fun to see is this started in 2020 and we had some tools, but nothing this amazing. Both the city in Clean City Index and the American Forest Tool came out in the last year. So we now, we basically took them both and we filtered and this is the area that we're focusing to provide more tree canopy in these neighborhoods. So right now we're reaching out to Morris Hill, Central Bench, Bora and West Boise. We are about to unveil a Boise Tree Captains program, which will basically help train individuals that are interested in volunteering we will train them in the spring and they will help us select planting sites. We will provide them with trees and a group of volunteers in the fall and plant those trees. So that's really what I love about this 10 year initiative that Council President Clay put out because this does not happen overnight. We have learned along every step of the way. Our, our partnership is really diverse in the city of Boise. So every month we meet with the climate division, public works, planning, neighborhoods, the parks department, and we wrestle with how do we make sure and use this to make a difference on the ground? How do we make sure that we're planting the right trees in the right place for the right reason and that they're set up for success so that the people that now have those trees can grow them over time? So I would encourage you to plant a seed in your head. You will see coming out from us very soon the unveiling of the Boise Tree Captains program. So here's your call to action. There's a lot of tree work ahead to be done and we need your help. We need your help raising awareness about the City of Trees Challenge. As you saw in that graphic, we've planted about 4,000 trees so far towards that 100,000 trees. So obviously we're way behind. We should have 20,000 in the first two years, but we also recognize that we've grown strong roots and we believe that that will branch out into the future. Sorry about the tree pun. Uh, but we need your help getting awareness out there about that. There is an ability to donate to our cause through a cause app. You can do that on our website. It's a really, this is another opportunity that came up from a local company that started an application for donating to nonprofits. So we really look for those partners to grow local, to grow uh, robust local businesses to take care of these trees. So that's one way you can join us. You can purchase a City of Trees t-shirt, which every t-shirt donates enough money to plant two forest seedlings. It's a really fun and easy way to join the cause. You can plant a tree at your home and make sure if you do that, you go onto our website and help us make it count so we can track the benefit that tree is providing over time. And finally, you can really dig deep and help us as a Boise tree captain. And that'll be coming out. I think we'll probably launch our website next week and start recruiting those people. So plenty of ways for you to get involved. And I am excited that we now have plenty of time to talk with you because I already see the chat box filling up. Uh, I'm excited about what's advancing forward, not only what we're building with City of Boise, but that provides opportunities for other cities to join this effort throughout the Treasure Valley and beyond. So do you have any closing thoughts or comments, Amy, before we jump in the room together and answer questions? Um, no, nothing for me. So let's dive into the questions. All right. I will stop the screen sharing. Perfect. Thank you so much, um, both of you, Lance and Amy, for contextualizing urban forestry for us and, and how towns in Idaho and the Pacific Northwest can benefit from tree canopies. 
really, really interesting presentation. Um, and it leaves me, at least me personally, very hopeful. So um, we do have um, some questions. And so Brian, do you wanna go ahead and take that away? Uh, yeah, sure. So um, actually what I'll do, what we'll do is we'll, uh, if, if you would like Catalan or I to ask your question for you, just text it, chat it to us, or you can use it, you can chat it in the, the um, chat feature of Zoom as well. Um, you can send a direct message if you would like to keep it anonymous and we can read it out. Um, or if you'd like to ask your question yourself, we encourage you to do that. Uh, and you can take yourself off of mute and introduce yourself um, briefly and then and ask your question to the speakers. So um, we, I'll just start with a uh, first question that I have um, that, what, that came in is um, when we're talking about tree planting, um, what trees should we tr avoid planting in the arid environment that the Treasure Valley is located in? That's a great question. And I can actually point you to a resource that we built a few years ago called the Treasure Valley Tree Selection Guide. And that has all the recommended trees that are recommended. We brought together the growers, the designers, the planners, and the city foresters, and we came up with a list and we're actually revising that list right now. So I can add that into the chat and you guys can go and look at that. There, a big consideration is water use. If you're gonna plant an urban tree, you are gonna need to water that tree, but that's also why we're very strategic about where we plant a tree. If we're gonna plant a tree, we need to plant it in a place that, yes, it looks pretty, but also is it gonna clean the air and water? Is it going to be close to a home? Not too close, but close to a home where it shades it so we reduce our energy use. As you know, where we live right now, if you live in Boise, for example, or anywhere in the arid west, most likely where you live had no shade. It was mostly sagebrush and grass. And unless you're by a river, you didn't have trees. So we need to recognize that we have created an artificial environment for us to live in. Trees help it be more hospitable, but we need to be smart about where we plant those trees because it will take water, yes, but make sure it takes the right amount of water where it doesn't put us at a deficit. But I love that question because if you just say native, there is no native tree to where I am living in the north end of Boise. The only native trees are on the river and up in the mountains. So it's, uh, it's very important to be intentional about what you plant and why you plant it. So. I'll, uh, I'll put that link to the tree selection. Oh, Ethan put it in there, look at that. So a link in the chat for the tree selection guide. Thank you. Great, Good Thank question. You. And may maybe our native tree here in the North End would be the sagebrush? Yes, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, if you do have a question, you're welcome to raise your hand or and take yourself off mute or take yourself off mute and ask it. Um, we'll, we wanna make sure that you all feel comfortable asking your own question or you can go ahead and um, Catalan, go go ahead. <laughs> Figured I would give it a give it a start. Um, I did have a question. If you two know, um, how common is a plan like Boise's? Like how many other cities throughout the U.S. Um, take things like, or I mean, I guess we're specifically talking about urban forestry. So, how many cities throughout the U.S. have as serious as a plan as Boise does? That's a good question. Um, a, a lot of cities have management plans. A lot of cities have tree inventories. We actually have Meridian City Forester here with us and they have a management plan and a tree inventory. And what's fun about what we're building in Boise and we're highlighting Boise because there's so much alignment and we're doing the City of Trees Challenge, but we also help by raising up Boise and helping them. We also are helping Meridian as well and Nampa and Caldwell. But I would say, in my experience, having worked all around the country, there are a lot of great management plans out there. There are a lot of tools and resources. But I think what Boise does right is aligning people around a common vision. And also, what I showed you there with the suspended pavement technology, that is a big investment the city is making. So they, they're willing to put their money where their mouth is and also invest in those resources that is making a difference creating a better city for all. I think a lot of cities say they're doing it, but they're not. I feel like Boise is, is actually doing it, which is exciting. Is there anything you'd like to add to that, Amy? 
on the climate side of things? Um, I'm not super familiar with what other cities are doing for as far as trees go. I know that on climate, though, um, lots and lots of cities are developing climate action plans. It's really inspiring, actually. Um, cities are at the forefront of this because this is where the real change happens is at the city level. And so cities are cities are trying. So so just so you all know. <laughs> I'm glad you bring that up, Amy, because that's one thing that we saw in the past administration was cities rose up and said, hey, we're going to do mm -hmm. something about it. And city of Boise and our mayor, definitely somebody that did that. So good point. Diana, you, would you like to ask her a question? Yes. Hi. Thanks, Brian. Uh, Diana Winand. And apologies, I'm, I'm not local. I'm calling in from the Los Angeles area. Mm, uh, great. But, uh, uh, sister chapter, I'm uh, chair of the San Fernando Valley Climate Reality Chapter. So I'm um, with oh, you guys cool. in spirit. I love this presentation. It's really great. Uh, obviously, LA is in a similar situation, and we are, are in the process of planting a lot of trees. To follow up on Callan's question, though, do you guys, uh, would you be open to, or are you already considering having a sort of a, a sister city kind of a, an approach because I'm hearing things in your presentation that I have not heard uh, presented in, in LA's tree planting efforts. And I'm sure they're you know great minds and they don't always think alike and that's good. And so I'm wondering if that's been discussed, if that's a possibility, uh, I just feel like there could be some really nice synergy if uh, a couple of cities sort of adopt each other to at least share share best practices. So you could address Yeah, that. I'm surprised that I didn't plant that question. That's a perfect leading question. We actually, when we started the City of Trees Challenge, Elaine's vision had a few things that were really smart. One was tying the numbers to people. So this is climate action that every person in Boise can act towards. The other one was giving people an opportunity to make a difference in what's going on in the world in your backyard, but also inspire others to do the same. So what we're gonna do this year is we're gonna start a, a kind of webinar series with other similar like cities that are doing things like the City of Trees Challenge. And I know LA is doing some great work. I've seen and followed quite a bit of that. And so the idea would be LA, we learned a lot from City of Nashville. Anybody that's interested, we're gonna hold a monthly conversation where maybe the first or not monthly, quarterly, can't commit us to too much. Um, we will talk about maybe Boise's one time and then LA's the other time and then Nashville's, but share those kind of cross-pollinating opportunities so that people can learn. Because one thing that I love about what we do is we're not proprietary about anything. We want people to steal our ideas and make it better. And the only reason we're doing this well is because we've learned from other people and help make it better. So. I love that point. And Diana, I'd say follow up with us and we can loop you into that conversation. So we have a question in the, that came in the chat that I wanna um, raise to you, Amy and Lance. Um, what do you think about using bamboo and rapidly growing plants as carbon sinks in uh, non-native areas? Um, are they too demanding in terms of water consumption? Uh, are they too invasive? And this question is from Ethan. And, and similarly, Brennan has a, a question about um, uh, the feasibility of, of of implementing urban forestry in a more urban environment like here in Boise and, and if we're, how do we balance the water use? Do you have any thoughts on that, Amy? I am not very familiar with bamboo production. So I'm hoping you can take this one, Lance. <laughs> so what I would say, I love the out of the box ideas. I think what we need to be careful with is I would say no to the bamboo plan that is highly invasive and fast growing and it does suck up water, um, but it is okay to be creative. You know, I would, before you implement something like that, you need to talk to the experts that know what trees are gonna become invasive if we're bringing them in, we're not used to doing it. The other thing is people love fast growing and something that does something fast. Usually the best tree to survive and thrive for a hundred years is gonna start a little slower and then achieve that growth over time. So. I would refer you again to the tree selection guide on things like that. There are unique opportunities. I've heard the concept of microforests, planting dense packs of trees in different areas. Um, but there are a lot of really good experts in 
forest restoration, riparian restoration, things like that to make sure that if we do something that it's not swinging us too far the other way. But I love the creativity, but I would say, sorry, Ethan, I wouldn't do the bamboo thing. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Lance and Amy. Um, Lila, do you can go ahead and ask your question. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Leela, and I work at the Metropolitan Planning Organization for the region uh, called COMPASS. And in the new Infrastructure Investment um, and Jobs Act, there's some identified funding for carbon reduction and um, resilience, as well as um, environmental justice. So I think we've been talking about trees in our organization and, and different work groups that we have. And I was wondering, um, how you measured urban heat um, and if it's just surface temperature or if there's other considerations that you had when you built the urban heat map? That's a good question, Lila. So you with um, the local compass in, yeah. in the Treasure Valley? Oh, cool. Yeah, we should chat because there is definitely quite a bit of money coming in through the infrastructure bill. There's a big transportation package, which as you know, this it's exciting to get the bill passed, but it takes a while for them to figure out how that money flows. But we will have our eyes on some of that for transportation in the urban arena. And also there's a bunch of money for forest forestry work. Um, the urban heat island study that we did, and you can find it on our website on tvcanopy.net. There's a link that says canopy continuum. Um, that was an actual ground surface area measurement that we did with a group called, it was Portland State University and Kappa Strategies. So we actually had these heat sensors that we'd put on our car window and roll them up and then drive around at different times during the day. And we ended up picking what I think was the hottest August day in um, 2019 where we did that. And it was it's just really valuable data. And they're doing that in more and more cities. So that data is available like for Compass to use uh, we use it, City of Boise uses it, but um, now they, I think, might have sensors that you can put on bikes. They have different ways that they're measuring that, but the whole climate and heat data movement is pretty fascinating, and we were lucky because of the relationships we had with Portland State that we got to do it early on, but I, it wouldn't be a bad idea to repeat something like that. The other valuable data we're getting out of that is health data and also air quality data as well, so that answer your question? Yeah, that does. Thank you so much. It is exciting. And that sounds like a great project to just bike around and <laughs> get, get a temperature of count. Yeah. Anyway, thank you. Hey, thank you. Um, so Bill, go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Brian. And thanks for the great presentation. Um, so uh, I'm a, a physician in town and a parent, uh, like many folks probably on this call. So it makes me think of two things. One, um, trying to have safe places for people to exercise uh, and bike in, you know, ideally non-carbon producing ways um, is really important. And I was very impressed with the city's um, uh, pathways master plan um, to help to convert some of the um, uh, canal side service trails into um, uh, trail or uh, service roads into trails, um, as well as connected uh, neighborhoods in Boise. Um, uh, Amy, you might know about this, Lance, you might know about this, but is there any, um, uh, coordination with tree planting along the canals? Uh, do they not want that to steal all the water? Is that a problem? And then on the, the a second question, and I'm sure you all have thought about this, but you know, as a parent, my uh, teenage daughter does a lot of projects with her school at One Stone and um, getting kids involved in this, whether it's an Eagle Scout project or, you know, kids at Boise High or One Stone or any of the other schools around here, um, uh, it seems like they would jump on this. So I, I'm sure there's been some discussion there, but I'd like to hear about those kind of two areas of, of interface. You want um, to start on that, Amy? Sure. So I agree with you that the pathways, um, the pathways plan is very cool. I have read it. I'm not extremely familiar with it. It was done out of our planning department and I'm really looking forward to hearing a presentation about that at some time in the near future. Um, I know because I have heard uh, Council President Clegg talk about it that she would love to see coordination with the canals and get some trees there. Um, I don't know the feasibility of that or how far in the future that would be, but it is on our radar. So stay tuned. 
Um, and Lance, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I would just build on that. And thanks for those questions, Bill. Um, the Council President Clegg was a big part of that whole pathways plan. And given that the city is so invested in tree canopy, and they know that these areas where they want people to walk, if there's absolutely no shade, then that's not good. A lot of people aren't going to walk there. So you're right on the canals. It can get a little bit tricky, uh, but I am confident that the right people will come together to where we can plant trees we will instead of planting or building structures that aren't going to provide all the benefits that trees do. So, but that was a very exciting thing that uh, a lot of people worked on and having both uh, both Elaine and Jimmy involved in that was huge. Uh, and then to add to the youth part, that's the Boise Tree Captains, there is a vision to have also some high school youth involved in that. I know we have a pretty active group here um, at Boise High that I think is involved in climate and One Stone has some good stuff too. So we would love to keep building on that. Uh, it's, it's one of our goals that we haven't executed on quite yet. But I will tell you having a teenage daughter and seeing how adamant they are about purchasing the right things and changing things to make a better climate. It's going to happen. I feel like we're the bridge to getting them there, um, but they're going to change it way more than we think we will. So great question. Yeah, and, and I'll add that the city has involved youth in climate and climate planning, and we have um, a great youth council right now that's been um, involved. They just planted a carbon capture garden up by the Foothills Learning Center. And so that will continue with a new group of youth every year. So um, the mayor is really excited about involving the next generation. Rob, great to have you join us today. You can go ahead and ask your question. Hi, my name is Rob Lonning. I live in Haley. I'm one of the co-founders of the uh, Climate Action Coalition of the Wood River Valley. And this is a question for Lance. You, I, I believe I heard you mention that the tree planting that you've been involved in has been a way of tying individuals, getting indiv individuals involved. And this for me falls under the category of outreach. And I think that's been one of the issues that uh, I've been dealing with here in the Wood River Valley is basically, you know, there's a handful of people who are really actively involved, but most people aren't. And it, I would be very curious to see or to hear more about what you've been doing, um, your efforts for uh, engaging community members. It does sound like it's like you're saying something like, well, you know, you can at least plant a tree, which I think is cool. But mm -hmm. I don't want to put words in your mouth. I, I'd like to hear more about what, what you've been doing and, what, and how that's working. Yeah, no, I appreciate that, Rob. And it's good to hear the organization you're involved in. I'm actually doing some work up in the Wood River Valley right now, so I, you should shoot me an email. But we're building similar efforts using Forest Service funding to focus on building climate resilience in the Wood River Valley with the county and all the cities and focusing some as tree planting, some as tree removal, addressing forest health. So I'd love to talk to you about that because uh, we're trying to build a very similar model there. It evolved to something I think very different in the Treasure Valley than what it will evolve to there. But it's, it is hard to get people active and engaged, right? Because we're all busy, we're all working hard every day or playing with the kids. So I think you really need to people, meet people where they're at. Um, and it takes a while to build those relationships as well. So when I talk about the tree captains program, and this is a challenge with delivering community outreach and an equity focus is that often those of us that have swoop into the places where people don't have, and we say, hey, look, we selected you to plant trees and we're gonna plant trees in your garden. Isn't this cool? But we didn't take the time to get to know them and what they're really interested in. And so, that's what we're slowly growing here in the Treasure Valley. We're by far to where we need to be, but we're listening, we're learning, we're adapting and evolving. And the City of Trees Challenge uh, Tree Captains program might be something for you to, to learn from, and I'd love to share it with you. So I would say follow up with me, and I'd love to talk about what you're working on in the Wood River Valley. Thank you for that question. Uh, another question that came in um, 
uh, Lance and Amy is what are your thoughts on planting trees in the Boise foothills? Um, and if we were selecting native species, which I know is a complicated term, um, could we successfully cover some of the barren foothills with treescape? Um, or is this a policy or a, a, an objective we would want to avoid? Do you have any thoughts on that, Amy? Um, I guess I think it would be challenging to grow trees in the foothills given the limited amount of water. But honestly, Lance is the tree expert here, so I'll, <laughs> I'll let him add. I'm more the climate expert. <laughs> Well, I think when we look at the foothills, and it's an interesting strategy and thought, um, but when we're with limited water resources, we can look at maybe restoring riparian areas where there are water sources and increasing canopy there to reduce the heat in those water areas. But I don't think we want to be planting on the open landscapes because there's just not enough water there. The trees aren't going to thrive. Um, there's a lot of unique strategies once... It, like if a fire comes through, I think you can do the right restoration activities where maybe you have a few more shrubs than you had before um, and healthy grasses. But I wouldn't, I don't think I'd advocate planting a bunch of trees on the barren landscapes. There's just not enough resources for that. It would change the landscape too much. And I don't think it would be sustainable. Good questions though. Um, and, and if anyone else has, wants to ask their own question, feel free to raise your hand. Um, Another question that has come in, um, <laughs> Ethan wants some shade uh, on, in the foothills when he's mountain biking. Um, another question that has come in is um, uh, uh, when you're thinking about planting a tree around your house, are there certain sides of the house that you should be, you should prioritize um, Northwest, for example? Yeah. That's a great question. And that's why if you look at our shade tree project website, we kind of developed that moving infograph that shows you if you live in our climate and environment, you'll notice that people that have a beautiful view to the west, they have a really hot house. In, in this area where we live, that heat in summertime comes from the west. So that's where we work with Idaho Power to have trees planted. Of course, make sure it's far enough away from your house so it doesn't encroach on your house. But if you plant to the west of your house, that's the place to, uh, to shade your tree for energy use in our climate environment. Thanks. Uh, Pamela. Oh, hi. Um, my question was about, um, uh, you know, all the new houses that are coming up in the foothills. Um, are there any legislation or requirements from the city saying you should plant like so many trees? Is that something we can do uh, to, you know, help with the tree plantation? Because you're already spend pumping in the water to keep their lawns green. So can we say no lawns and more trees? <laughs> That's a good question. And Jerry McAdams is on the, uh, on the line here and he, helps do a lot of our wildland urban interface planning. And so he can chime in as well if he'd like, but there it's important to look at firewise plant material. So you wouldn't wanna have too dense of a forest, so to speak, around your house in the foothills if a fire was to happen to come, but there are trees, there are spacing that you can do that is smart. Um, and the other thing I would say is water smart as well. Grass, you know, while everybody loves their lawn, it probably is the biggest water hog, so to speak. Um, but just be smart about it. Plant a little bit of grass for your kids to play in, water it in a way that works, and then plant trees in the right areas and water them in a way that isn't overwatering them. A lot of times people will overwater their trees. Um, so like anything, keep it in balance, but it's not a bad idea to plant some trees around your house in the foothills. Just make sure they're the right trees and they're firewise. And that's one thing we're updating actually with our tree selection guide. We're gonna talk a little bit more about the firewise piece because that's a major reality in our foothills areas. Do you have something to add to that, Amy? Um, sure, I'll, I'll add that the city is in the process right now of updating our development code and it will address these types of issues. Um, and if you would like to comment there, I believe there's opportunities to comment on it. So please get involved in that. 
The, the other thing that I'd add, and that's good that the city's redoing a lot of their codes and I'd be active in that folks if you have some experience, is I came from Albuquerque, New Mexico before I moved here. And there they had such a strong water conservation effort that they actually, they would basically take a lawn, cover it in rocks, and it would kill the tree that was there. And then they went all the way from a shaded area to a huge urban heat island. So let's be smart about how we transition less water use. If you're taking out lawn and putting in a bunch of rock, you probably just move too far the other way. So balance it, zero escape, have some green space, or it will be more brown space here, but don't, don't swing so far the other way that we end up in a worse problem than we were to start with. That's helpful um, to, to know, Lance. Uh, Ethan, go ahead. Hey, uh, Amy, I had a question for you about the, um, the sort of climate map that you had uh, on one of the slides earlier. Do you know if there's a correlation between um, the air quality index and tree canopy coverage in specific areas of the city like there is with the heat and temperature? Um, you know, does more trees equal cleaner air in specific areas or is that more a, a broad issue? Um, that's a great question, Ethan. I don't think there was a lot of overlap between those two, the air quality. Um, what we saw in the Clean Cities Index, we did map air quality. And first of all, our air quality here in general is pretty good. And the differences that we saw in were really small when you went from neighborhood to neighborhood and seemed to mostly be associated with areas that were really close to a lot more traffic. Um, and as I'm sure all of you that live in Boise are well aware, uh, our biggest air quality threat lately has been smoke. And um, that doesn't seem to change a lot like on a neighborhood by neighborhood basis necessarily. It's the whole valley that gets enveloped, unfortunately. <laughs> Uh, just follow up question to that, Amy. Do you know with the state legislative bill that's going right now where they're talking about removing auto emission standards, um, do you know would that impact the city or does the city have a way to maintain um, auto emission standards even if the state legislator removed the requirement for auto emission standards? Yeah, that's another good question. Um, so it's DEQ is in support of that legislation and they're the ones that handle all the, the local air quality regulations. And so it's our understanding that because our air quality has actually improved since that regulation was started, we, the, we were in non-attainment for, um, for air quality for since the 80s and now we aren't anymore. And so there's not a federal requirement for us to be checking emissions anymore. And so that's my understanding is that's why they would eliminate that. Um, but again, yeah, that's not, the city wouldn't maintain that. If it's eliminated, the city wouldn't have its own requirement if that makes, if that answers your question. And that's actually an, an interesting one and I'll be quick because I know we're wrapping up, but I almost wonder Ethan if cars are so much better now. You know, most new cars, of course, are better than when they put that into place. I've never looked into it much, but it might not be a moot point. I don't know, but that's a good question to think about. Go ahead, Brian. No, that was a really interesting question and Amy, interesting information that about um, the Treasure Valley moving out of that, that, uh, um, that zone and, and apparently have cleaner air, it sounds like. Um, Great. Well, uh, I think we should, we have time. We're actually at the top of the hour. So Catalan, I'll hand things over to you. Yeah. Yeah. So we obviously want to be mindful of everyone's time. Um, so we're going to go ahead and wrap up right now, but thank you everyone so much for coming and thank you for all the wonderful questions. And if we can get a great round of virtual applause for our presenters, that was really great. Thank you so much for Amy and Lance for coming and talking to us about urban forestry. Um, so um, if y'all still have questions or would like to connect with Amy and Lance or Amy or Lance, um, feel free to reach out to them or, you know, you can reach out to us as well by just responding to our email that you received on for the event. 
um, and we can put you in touch with them. Um, and we really hope that you all are able to join us on March 11th for our next talk. Um, we'll be emailing out some more, you know, um, details on that. And this is going to be a conversation about zero waste policy. So um, Jillian, oh, Eichelhoff, I think is how you say her last name. Um, she's from the Zero Waste Institute, uh, Zero Waste Boise Institute. Um, and she'll be talking to us, uh, talking to us about zero waste um, and how to make that possible without stressing out about it too much. Um, so we hope that you can join us and feel free to join our chapter as well. We'd love to see more folks with us. I'll go ahead and put that in the chat. Um, and yeah, with that, I think we're set for the day. We're just a minute over, two minutes over. <laughs> um, but thank you again, everyone for joining. Thank you all very much. Thanks everyone. Yes, yeah, thank you, Lance. Thank you, Amy. Thanks everybody.